Uh, Eric Sokol of the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Thank you very much for a very instructive um, panel. I uh, have a question about Medicare reimbursement. Uh, Ms. Hirschman, you said that your um, patients are, are reimbursed under Medicare Advantage. So it's, um, <clears throat> so it, it, the service was um, a, a service that was a service line that's offered through our home care agency and is paid for. They have a contract with um, Aetna and IBC, and they've created a, a, a but it's for, um, and we tested it originally with the Medicare Advantage program, and I believe that all the rest of the programs are Medicare type programs that are through these uh, through these two insurance companies. Would and they, these patients have a skilled service in order to qualify for Medicare home health. Um, I, I believe that uh, I believe that yes, I do. I think that they meet the criteria. Um, I don't think that they all have to meet that particular. Um, no, I do, excuse me, I do, I do believe they all had to meet the home care eligibility in order to, to receive the service, yes. Oh, okay. But in our work that we've done before, they haven't been requ always required to have right. that. Because I think if we expand it to folks who don't need the skilled service but could still rely on the care management, that the, and that gets me to my next question, which is for, the, um, uh, for Christopher Callahan, Dr. Callahan. Um, you know, Senator Casey actually has a bill out that's very similar to what you want to do, but he has not nurse practitioners, but home care aides doing the care management. Are you concerned that that's a level of, uh, that's too low on the uh, training spectrum to be able to do this type of care management? Well, if, if a person, if you had this person that was, had whatever it is that lets them care for another person, so you have to start off with that requirement. Um, I think there is uh, a much, say, lower level of training that could deliver some of these services and therefore reallocate the higher cost, higher skilled uh, folks to cover a larger population of patients. So um, I can't remember if this came from Laura Gitlin or one of our projects, but one of the OTs was in the house and the big problem was there was no toilet seat. She got a toilet seat and put it on there. Now, if I had her in my home health care agency, I'd be like, hey, I'm not paying you to, you know, do." there's a lot of people I could pay, to, but there's a bunch of these simple things that's, you know, it's like for lack of a horse, the battle, you know, was lost where you just go, oh my gosh, if you'd only, because, and the geriatricians love these stories. It's like, she didn't have a toilet seat. She got up in the middle of the night, you know, the floor got slippery, she broke her hip, she ended up in the nursing home and it just, you know, goes on. And there's a whole bunch of those uh, little things. So here's the thing, the, you can't then, which is what happens when you go to the less skilled labor, you go, well, it's okay so long as they have supervision. Then you get it out in the field, and while no one's looking, they fire the supervisor. So that's scary, uh, too. Uh, so as long as you had that sort of level of accountability, yes, I think you could do it. It's interesting because I heard the senator talk about this program, and he was saying the exact same thing that you were, that these are the people that establish the trust with the family that have the day-to-day -day interaction, but he was talking about the home care aid as opposed to the nurse practitioner. I guess there's an, another level of savings there if you can drill it down to that level. There's not only another level of savings, but in terms of getting a workforce in the field quickly. Right, that's, yeah. You don't want to wait the 12 years for a geriatrician. Could you describe your C, CMS, uh, your project with CMSI? Yes, so there, the, the project that was um, published, the clinical trial that was published, it's like eight years old now. We got funding from the National Institutes of Mental Health to implement it practically. That meant convince your CFO uh, of those downstream savings and design it. The way it got practically implemented was that uh, the target population are the older adults with cognitive impairment who have been recently hospitalized. When they come out of the hospital, then it's combining a um, collaborative care management with, with what is essentially a transition. So they have a nurse practitioner that's coming out to the house after that hospitalization. 
But then what she's doing is delivering that intervention in primary care with the primary care doc, but we had to pull her out of the primary care offices so it's in the home. And what you should hear in that is like all of these echoes of all of this literature. I mean, it's kind of like uh, a Frankenstein we put together of everybody's projects, you know, the uh, guided care is that way too. It's like, well, that's a generic component, let's put that in. And what happens then is that a lot of people then wonder, well, why did you limit it to cognitive impairment? You know, like which takes you full circle, you know, back to transitions in care. And then, uh, and then other, then what happens to us that we're really not prepared for, I know this is a whole nother topic, but there are a whole bunch of middle age to early older adult developmentally disabled people hidden in the house next to you. And they're showing up in geriatric clinic and, uh, and pediatric clinic, and there's nothing like in between. So when people see these, they go, they'll go, well, if it's good for a person with dementia, why isn't it good for, you know, somebody else? I, I, there are probably other questions, maybe. Yeah. Sorry. Something I've been thinking about since Mary Middleman was saying this morning that Alzheimer's disease isn't just an individual disease, it's a family disease. Well, it's also a neighborhood disease and a community disease. And kind of in line with the discussion we've just been having, do any of you, particularly David, I, I sort of think with your very highly computerized, manualized com protocol, do you see a place for volunteerism, for faith-based communities that are acting as the person that somebody can talk to? Because I know certainly in my clinical practice, I see families that do not want someone from AAA coming into their home or a home health aid, but they are happy to let the neighbor come in or let the woman who they used to sing and choir with come and help them with these things because there's already an established relationship. And if these people could be trained with some sort of systematic procedure uh, support that had oversight, uh, is there a place for that, do you think? Uh, I think so. We, we had many conversations with different large church churches in our in the Cleveland area most of them had a retired or active social worker or people who are part of their uh, older adult ministry and they liked this as a potential tool but we never implemented it in any of them they they didn't uh, really want to dig that deep it makes something that but I think potentially yes I just wonder if the archdiocese of somewhere or the other would see this as something you know that might be a, a way of outreach to a growing population that they have to serve. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Uh, my question is regarding advanced care planning. So I'm uh, concerned for the stressors that patients and caregivers experience associated with repeat hospitalizations and wondering about, uh, I don't know if it was in the list that I couldn't read, Chris, of all of the things that the primary care physician can be doing, but beginning advanced care planning as early as possible to think about um, at what point DNR orders are instituted and uh, the prevention of terminal hospitalizations from nursing home. So advanced care planning was not in the list uh, that you saw. Uh, as you may know, one of my um, colleagues is Greg Sachs, and he's been trying to get a program funded that um, basically builds from this type of intervention but weaves advanced care planning and palliative care in it much sooner. Um, the, one of the difficulties I think is, is that um, there's such a broad range of patients with dementia and especially if you're in, you start including the people with mild cognitive impairment. Um, the image that comes in any particular person's mind when you say Alzheimer's disease or dementia um, is, is huge. It's almost like, uh, I remember the commercial where people stand up and they're like, hi, I'm Chris Callahan and I have dementia. And then you stand up and, you, and that's really what it is, that incredibly heterogeneous uh, group. So my difficulty um, clinically is knowing when to bring that topic up. 
Um, I brought it up less after the death panels uh, uh, issue than I did uh, beforehand. So it's again a cultural um, thing and part of uh, Greg's uh, intervention is helping that become part of the normal package of things that you talk about. And because by the time I sort of get the guts to bring it up, too often the person's coming back from the hospital with a feeding tube, you know, and you're like, uh, I was too late, you know. And even when you do bring it up, that uh, still happens. So it was not part of this intervention. And um, it's a lot harder to do in practice than I thought it would be. And part of it's because of the, not only the heterogeneity of the disease and the other diseases, but because, as was mentioned this morning, the cultural diversity that some people need it brought up in one way and some people need it brought up in the other. The last thing I'll say about it is it's way easier in 2012 to bring it up if the person has cancer. But that wasn't true when I started. It was just as hard to bring it up when the person had cancer, say, back in the mid-1980s. Uh, and so part of it's kind of like get on with it. You know, we need to get on with doing it. I'm just going to add to that that um, you know, we're in the process of analyzing um, our data around advanced care planning, specific with our transitional care model intervention. Um, we did ask about it and we did follow it, and it was one of the um, many times talking about end of life care issues did come up. Although these patients that we enrolled in our last study, which we tested the advanced care plan, uh, the transitional care model with cognitively impaired older adults and their family members. Um, you could, uh, one of the exclusion criteria was being terminal or having less, a prognosis of six months or less or being on hospice. So it was, you were excluded. Uh, we had a, only about 10% of our population in our study did die within six months, which, um, so we do have um, some data that we're gonna be start looking at and seeing about what, what that intervention looked like and what those different types of interventions that were more palliative um, in nature for, for the symptoms as well as, as uh, advanced care planning. I say one other thing. I just, it's also amazing how bad we are at guessing who's uh, within six months or 12 months right. with dementia. These people were on hospice. Yeah, I, it's like, it's, <laughs> that was our we're, 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 we're bad at that, you know, of knowing who, the one who's right. really uh, close. It wasn't a reflection on your <laughs> criteria. So that, I'm actually going to build on your question, and that is it seems to me that each of you, you know, are really starting to create a system that we sort of were talking about earlier, and that part of that is th each of you have a different way of doing um, like a needs assessment or a risk appraisal, if you will, and then, you know, making referrals or putting in different interventions. And so I think all the interventions we've spoken about earlier could easily be plugged in to any one of your um, models of care. And I guess my question is, in addition to the advanced care planning, from your vantage, from your respective vantage points, where do you see we need to build um, new interventions and new evidence? Like, you have a sense of what needs to be done and we have practical know-how, but where, you know, what intervention should we be testing now uh, as part of your um, overarching care coordination approach? Well, the, one of the places I would start, and despite what some people at Hopkins think, <laughs> we, I mean, we don't have any good way to treat depression, if that's even what it is in uh, dementia. And um, I mean, we need some non-pharmacologic uh, treatments uh, for depression in dementia. And, uh, well, I'd love to have pharmacologic ones too, but I mean, there's a lot of, just about everything's been, you know, tried there and there isn't great evidence for it. Now, what I just said is not necessarily reflect how other people would interpret the literature on uh, depression in dementia, but I think everyone would agree that we have room for uh, non-pharmacologic interventions in depression. But, you know, trying to do like brief problem-solving psychotherapy on a person with dementia, I don't, I don't even, you know, know what that is. And, and I wonder, even as you go back to MCI, you know, uh, how much of this is uh, 
if you look at the number of people with dementia on, a, on an antidepressant, it's amazing. So that's one where I think there's a lot of work.